Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 percent of show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, the Baltic nation of Estonia will now have women both as head of state and head of government, with Kai Kallas becoming prime minister, the 43-year-old being sworn in by the country's first ever female president. We'll also be talking to the Irish ambassador to France, Patricia O'Brien, on how Ireland is using St Bridget's Day, which celebrates the country's only female saint, to promote the achievements of inspirational women. And how a traditional sport practiced exclusively by women and girls in the Democratic Republic of Congo is rising in popularity. But first, and Estonia has a new government led by a female prime minister for the first time in the Baltic country's history. Kai Kallas, having been sworn into the position after her centre-right party, formed a new coalition with the centre-left. She's also appointed women to six out of the 14 ministerial positions. Yuka Roya has more. A historic scene in Estonia. The first female president of the country appointing the nation's first woman prime minister since independence. Dear people of Estonia, the sun has just risen and today Estonia will have a new government. 43-year-old Kaya Kallas, the leader of the centre-right and pro-business reform party, leads a new two-party coalition. Six of her 14 ministers are women. I want an Estonia that's open to new ideas. I want an Estonia which courageously projects itself into the future with interesting visions. Some of the world's most powerful women, including European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Central Bank Chief Christine Lagarde, have welcomed the move as a positive step in Europe's pursuit of gender balance. Six of eight nations in Northern Europe, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Finland, Lithuania, and now Estonia, have governments led by women. The Baltic country, however, has the worst gender pay gap in Europe. Kalas has also pledged to restore the nation's reputation after two years with a far-right party in its government. Back in 2019, Estonia was forced to apologise after the leader of that party mocked Finland's new prime minister as a sales girl and questioned the young female leader's ability to run the country. Now, February 1st in Ireland is St Bridget's Day, which celebrates the country's only female patron saint. Born in 451 AD, St Bridget became a respected leader and peacemaker as she mediated between warring tribes. But this Saint's Day is undergoing an extraordinary remake. It's been used now by Ireland to showcase the work of inspirational and trailblazing women in a variety of fields. Joining me is the Irish Ambassador to France, Patricia O'Brien. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. What motivated Ireland to reframe St Bridget's Day? Well, thank you very much, Annette. Uh... St. Bridget was a radical 5th century saint who, along with our other great patron saint, St. Patrick, experienced slavery in her youth, but she dedicated her life to charity, to learning and to healing. So we in Ireland now, we celebrate the achievements and creativity of women in a wide range of fields, as you've mentioned. On the 1st of February, which is St. Bridget's Day, and it's also the uh, celebration of the commencement of spring in pagan times. So this is a moment of optimism and hope, much needed in these current times. Ambassador, can you give me some examples of the women who have been celebrated this year? We have in design and architecture, we have a, a wonderful woman who is in the field of, of architecture, who won with her partner the Pritzker Prize, Yvonne Prowl. And in fact, we have a commitment from Mairead McGuinness, um, the commissioner in Brussels, to talk to us about issues in finance. We have a range of women engaged in peacekeeping operations and we have composers, uh, at least conductors, sorry, in, uh, in, in the music field. 
Now, this move very much reflects the changes in Irish society from being one of the most traditional Catholic societies in Europe to a nation that prides itself these days on its liberal values. Uh, for instance, in 2018, Irish voters chose to legalise abortion in a historic referendum. But how much more needs to be done for women's equality? There's always more to be done, and we're very acutely aware of this on a daily basis uh, in Ireland at the, at the highest level through government and also through the day-to-day -day lives of our, of our citizenry. We are very, very conscious of the importance of, of empowering women. As you've mentioned, Ireland has been transformed um, over the last number of, really in the recent past, essentially because the people want to change. I'll just give you, if, if it's of any interest, I'll give you a little bit of background, really, in, in terms of why we've, why we've transformed so much. In 1973, we joined the European Union. We've had increasing diversity since that time in all walks of life. Increased secularism is, is very evident now in the country. Um, we've had increasing representation of women and other historically marginalized groups in leadership roles. And essentially, a functioning democracy such as ours with representative institutions have borne out the will of the people, but it's the voice of the people in Ireland that has really brought about this transformative change. And as you've mentioned, one of our referenda, I would say just by way of, uh, to crystallise by way of background, in a sense, and this is my own personal opinion, the Irish instinct um, for freedom, for inclusiveness, for tolerance and for progress is really the, are really the issues that have led to these changes and to this difference of voice. And it was the people's voice that brought about and was heard indeed in the marriage equality referendum in 2015, in the abortion refer referendum in 2018, and also, of course, our, the appointment and, and choice of two women presidents for our country, about which we're very proud. It's also, I imagine, due to the diminishing influence of the Catholic Church. Well, of course, and I, I would say that you know the civic engagement which we have, which we have invo been involved in, like our citizens' assembly project, have essentially replaced religious and and patriarchal dogma, which was so endemic in our country for so long. But this has now, to all intents and purposes, been replaced with this new voice, and the people have been empowered to reshape our country. And, and to transform our society. And this is evidence as, uh, as a result of the, the results of these referenda have shown how, how transformed we are. But there's more to be done. There's always more to be done. And this is recognised from the top down. And of course, Ireland recently releasing its report on the mother and baby homes where some 9,000 children died between 1922 and 1998. Uh, the Irish Prime Minister saying it opened a window into a deeply misogynistic culture in Ireland over several decades. Has that misogyny, however, totally disappeared? Well, look, I would love to say yes, but misogyny is still part of all our societies and we have to work towards eliminating it as fast as we can. I mean, this event to which, this episode to which you refer, of course, has been a deeply tragic episode in our history. As an Irish mother, and I know that I, I many people would share my view on this, this experience has brought us, you know, terrible shame, um, sadness, and and real sense of anger actually that that this has been a part of our past but it's one that we have now confronted that as our prime minister said we need to confront we have a responsibility to confront and that is what we have done and what we must continue to do um, as as you mentioned this it's a very topical issue for us and we all individually and collectively in ireland feel the pain of, of the people who have suffered so deeply through this episode. Ambassador O'Brien, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And finally, a sport with a difference. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Zango, a traditional sport practised exclusively by women and girls, has been growing in popularity. It's a mixture of dance, singing and gymnastics and now recognised as an official sport within the nation. And its players are hoping to bring it to the Olympics as our team on the ground report. Oh, Mark. It may have originated in playgrounds, but make no mistake, Zango is anything but chance play. On either side of the pitch, two teams vie for victory. Mokolo Ibende, steel legs in Lingala, and Kuya, which means come in Swahili. One by one, players jump and clap their hands to the rhythm of traditional songs, while throwing their legs into the air as quickly as possible. If a player raises her left foot and the opposite player raises her right foot, then the first team scores one point. But if both players raise the same foot, then the other team wins. Zango, which means footwork in Lingala, is played in two halves of 25 minutes each. The team that scores the most points wins the game. It's an all-female sport that appeals to players of all ages and backgrounds. We played Zongo because it keeps our waistlines in check, it gives us strength and it prevents illnesses. Zongo gets us outside, it keeps us active. Edith Kongolo set up the Steel Legs team with women from her neighbourhood. Now she's passing on her passion to her daughters. Are you going to beat your mum? We'll see. If you want to beat me, you have to raise the same foot. Zango is recognised as an official sport in DR Congo and Congo Brazzaville, with national federations active in both countries. My dream is to make it an Olympic sport, so that everyone learns about Zango. While it remains little known internationally, Zango is proving increasingly popular on the continent. It's also played in Cameroon, Gabon and the Central African Republic. And that's it for this edition. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.